All right, good morning. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on your Friday. I know this is a professional development day, so we really appreciate the school district giving us a chance to talk to you all about the new building project. Um, as you can see behind me, this is we are Garvin Miller. Uh, there should be four of us up here. There's Stacy. Um, <laughs> Uh, part of the design team for the new K-5 buildings. It's a super exciting time. And our uh, activity today is just to really listen and understand what you all think as you're in the buildings with the students day in and day out, how we can make this project the best it can be. So we're really just gonna ask a lot of questions and want feedback from you all today. This is educational visioning is what we call this process. And um, like I said, session number one, it's all about understanding you all. Then we'll go through a couple more steps, some building tours, we'll work through some floor plan options and things like that. You do have an agenda on your tables. Probably looks like this. I will try my best to keep us on track and on task as the tour guide today, but um, just wanted to uh, explain that we do kind of have a timed out. We'll be respectful of your time and be out of here in hopefully three hours. And there is some group work. That's why you're all sitting at your tables. And we ask you not to sit with anybody from your same grade level. So thank you. We got good light going on. <laughs> All right, um, as terms of introduction, since we have masks on, we thought we'd put our pictures up here so you can see our full faces. Um, Laura Little is over there. She's our project manager, our fearless leader on the project, so all complaints can go directly to her. <laughs> Everything that happens that goes wrong is Laura's responsibility. Everything that goes right is the, the rest of us. <laughs> um, visioning team, we got Casey Corbett over here. She's an architect, part of our team. Hannah Holtzackle to my left, architectural designer. And I'm Becky Boimer. I'm an interior designer by trade. And I'll just be, like I said, your tour guide, kind of facilitating our, our whole discussion today. So feel free to grab any of us if you have a question or need anything um, at all during the day today. Um, we are gonna ask for some introductions, but it's such a big group that we're gonna just do a little something to get us moving, and then we'll be able to learn a few people and start to get a feel for this group. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up for a second. <laughs> all right, please remain standing if you've worked at Bethel for longer than one year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so please remain standing if you've worked here for longer than five years. <laughs> Do I need to move faster through these numbers? Please remain standing if you've worked here longer than 10 years. All right, 15 years. Okay. Nobody's lost track of their number? <laughs> uh, 20 years. Got a few. 25 years. <laughs> 30 years. Oh. Now you get the microphone. Oh. <laughs> what is your name, your role, or relationship to Bethel schools, and what was your fondest memory of elementary school? <laughs> I'm Susan Pytel. Um, this is year 31 at Bethel, and I'm a fourth grade teacher. I've been fourth grade for six years total and fifth grade for 25, and my fondest memory. I love the fact, I know this is going to change because of this, but the fact that we've been K-12 under one roof. In 2001, when the boys went to state for basketball, they came down, they ate lunch with our elementary kids. They looked up to them. They knew, our kids knew them by name. And so that was awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very much. You can sit down. That's great. Okay, I am going to ask everybody to stand up again. <laughs> All right. Please sit down if you, if it, uh, let's see, it took you longer than one hour to drive to work today. 
If you have longer than an hour commute, you deserve to sit down. All right, what about 45 minutes? Does anybody? Okay. What about 30 minutes? How about 25 minutes? Mary <laughs> said. How about 20 minutes? Good. How about 15 minutes? How about 10 minutes? Good. How about <laughs> directly from your home to school? Not counting any gas stations or babysitter drop offs. <laughs> How about eight minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> we only drive to school in four minutes. I heard you say four. So. Oh, you're all in just exactly four minutes. I know. Oh, I had somebody. How long does it take you to get to work? <laughs> Do you live here? You live here. Ah. You live here. Ah, I'm Mary Rowell. I'm the assistant principal here in the elementary. And my favorite memory is it's not really a favorite memory is a favorite feeling. It is just a feeling of home. Bethel is where I graduated from. Couldn't wait to get out and leave the nest and get out of the bubble. And as soon as I got out, had kids and was raising my family, realized there is no better place to be than inside this bubble raising your family. Um, our staff is absolutely amazing and our community is amazing. So I cherish the feeling of home that we have here. That's awesome, thank you. And I think that's uh, obvious in how close everybody lives to the school and how many of you have been teaching here for quite a long time. So I think that that helps us get a, a feel for the school and how much of a community this is for sure. So thank you all. Um, let's see if I, can, if I have time for one more. We'll do one more, everybody stand up. <laughs> all right, how, sit down if you did not graduate from Bethel. <laughs> All right, good. Now, did sit down if you did not go to, uh, like you only had high school. At Bethel, did you go before high school? All of you also went? K-12. <laughs> Are all of you K-12? Oh, sit down. So how many, we have how many left? One, two, three, four, five, six of you were K-12 at Bethel? Great. Let's share a little bit about ourselves. <laughs> I'm Amy Navalino, first grade teacher, obviously. Um, favorite memory of elementary school. Uh, go back to my first grade years since I spent first grade. And first grade feast, even as a first grade student. Of course, that time was back in the roots. Paper on the floor. We were just talking about that this morning in our team meeting. And it's awesome that we still get to have a lot of those traditions here at Bethel years and years later, even with the growth. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking of the greatest memory ever. My name is Joy Voke. Oh, I teach PE at Bethel. Oh, yeah, I really did want to think of a really cool thing because there's so many, of course. I like Susan mentioning, I remember Matt Witt coming in and watching a movie with my sixth graders. and. They went crazy. I don't know, it's endless. Um, I also appreciate Mary, like we are one big family, and I hope that that remains forever. Um, so spe specific memory? I, I don't know, yeah, there's just so many. So, sorry. Cindy <laughs> <laughs> um, Harris and yeah, K-12. Um, and I've been here 20, this is my 29th year. And same with Joy, there's just so many things. I remember when they decorated the elementary gym as the haunted house, and they would have us all go down there, the principals would decorate it and run it, and the special ed team, the special 
special teachers. And we were able to go down there and spend the day. They would show movies down there. Um, just they did a music room and it was like a gourmet. Yeah, there was a the maze. There was all kinds of little haunted house things. That's that awesome. Lights were and everything. Um, and then like field day, you all cheered everybody else on. They had a big awards program at the end of the day where they gave prizes. But you never felt left out, even though you didn't win, <laughs> because everybody enjoyed cheering for the other person. So. That's great. And now we're back. Some of the ones that are talking, I've already had, I coached them and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Still the assistant principal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I'll share a favorite new memory, and that is getting to experience Bethel through the eyes of a parent. Um, I already shared, you know, what it was like for me as as a student and for myself personally. But sharing what it's like as a parent watching my children come to school, um, hearing them come home and tell me all about the amazing things that I already know are happening here because I see it, but to get to hear it through their words and to see it through their eyes and as a parent to know how absolutely amazing this school is, um, is, is definitely memories that I will cherish forever. Okay, thank you. We got one more. Did somebody sit down? Sneak, sit down. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Durs. Um, I do custodial here. I went here K through 12, then 20 years later decided to come back. Um, one of my memories is kind of with us being all one. Like, I decided to go to the CTC, and I was like, whoa, I was used to this little school, and it was quite the change. So I missed the little school after experiencing something so big. So yeah, I like the little ones together in this. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. And thank you for all getting together today to do that. We hope this same kind of feedback and, and casual atmosphere can continue all day today. I guess I'll be, I'll uh, kind of just share a little bit um, about myself. We're not just gonna make you all uh, share that, but uh, my name is Becky Wimmer. Like I said, I'm from Minster, which is also a tiny little town. And that's where I grew up um, and went K through 12. My favorite memory of elementary school, well, it's probably not a great memory, but my mom was also a teacher there. And I remember getting called down to the office because I got in trouble, but instead of, like, the principal got on the loudspeaker and said, Becky Lutzman, that was my main name, come to the office, your mother's waiting for you. <laughs> Everybody, and I was just a mortified second grader at the time. So. Really uh, raised by the community of the school, right? At that point, so I appreciate the, the kind of the small town feel that y'all have, like you mentioned. So we can get on board with that. All right, things to remember today: we're sharing the policies. Y'all have your masks on. We did bring hand sanitizer. I think the elders wanted to make sure y'all know that's available. Name cards. I think almost everybody's got that. If you wouldn't mind, just so we can keep track, it's mostly for us. You all know each other. Um, snacks and refreshments. There are some elements in the or items in the back of the room. If you need some sugar or donuts or water, um, <laughs> feel free. We're going to try to bribe you with the answers and feedback with sugar to keep you all real chatty. <laughs> so please go back and get some. Um, your agenda's on the table. Um, I wasn't sure if we had anybody calling in online, but I don't think we do. This is being recorded. Just want to let you know. So if you have any of your colleagues that aren't here today that Want to watch or you want to go back and listen to these fun answers you can we're going to share that with brian and, and the team and then please share your ideas please don't hold back and please listen to others um, we're going to ask you for a lot of feedback here coming up so thank you very much and to get us started we've got a little bit of a thought starter video so the idea here is just to start kind of thinking outside the box yes we have a brand new school project that's really exciting yes there'll be budgets to content with. Don't worry, they'll, they'll, there will be constraints, but today we don't have them. So please just think big, think outside the box, and try to think differently than what, what you live in today. If you've already seen this, 
Um, just let me know, but hopefully. Sorry, it worked before. <laughs> That's how it always works, right? There we go. Okay. Well, that makes you strange. Makes sense. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. First one is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century. How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on Earth, on Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of when we went to school, we were told there was a story which is if you worked hard and did well, you got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that, and they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, so, I, mean, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, if you get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you have the money. But public education paid for from taxation compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it, um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in the capacity of a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally. What we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who've benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescription for ADHD. Don't mistake me here, I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of debate. 
What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising audience, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? No, boring stuff <laughs> at school, for the most part. It seems to me, not a coincidence totally, that the incidence of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I won't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but I say that they are particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts, especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak, when you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialised into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. It's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking, published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edmund de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways. Uh, to see multiple answers, not on one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of common example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paper clip? One of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paper clip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paper clip as we know it, Jim? You know? Um, now, the testers, and they gave them to 1,500 people this is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay. So, my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. 
George Henry, what percentage of genius level? 80. 80, I think. 98 percent. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of eight to ten. What do you think? 15. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can you? Now, this tells an interesting story because you could have imagined it going the other way. You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up, a lot. But one of the most important things that happened, and I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. They know they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. In outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but inside schools now. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think definitely about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, second, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups. The collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. Besides, besides uh, thinking about the, the skill it takes to draw on a whiteboard like that, <laughs> um, does anybody have any, we just really like to show that it kind of gets everybody thinking a little bit differently and you guys are teachers, you're, you deal with this in day in and day out where you have students that learn differently, that you have different types of subjects that you're teaching and sometimes uh, your actual physical environment is a hindrance and the least that we can do as part of this project is help shape that around you so that you can do what you want to do and that's kind of the, the feedback that we're looking for from you today but does anybody else have any comments on that video or want to ask any questions or feel strong about something so thanks for listening to that i just think that's a good one to get us started and um before we move on the next part that we are going to do is start um <laughs> I think it was four years ago, and I remember at the time Sorry. the talks weren't put online. It still went. That was the guy. I don't think he's the. I don't think he's the illustrator. That's his voice. There we go. Um, we were going to ask um, Justin here to to make a statement about um, just kind of some goals and givens of what we want from this project. Maybe kind of ideas you have, or just kind of marching orders. So the round of applause wasn't done on purpose. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Thank you, first and foremost, for being here today. Um, it's obviously nice to have a day off at school at the end of the first nine weeks. And just before we get started, I wanted to say uh, thank you for the work you guys have done. Uh, to be honest, if you would have asked me nine weeks ago, I never would have thought we would have got to this point. And I think probably the majority of the people in here thought the same thing. But it's because of the work you guys have done, the time and effort you've put into trying to maintain a safer and orderly environment as much as, as much as we can. Have things been perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but I think each and every one of us can say one thing. We're here for the kids. And I think, in my opinion, the kids have definitely benefited tremendously from being back to school. And I'm so excited to get for nine weeks in, and we're going to take it day by day, and we're going to continue to do what we're doing, and we're going to see where the ball, ball rolls and where it takes us. So with that being said, now to the good stuff, uh, educational vision. The idea behind today was to take input from you folks. 
the people that are in the trenches each and every day. And so we've tried to include a lot of different employee groups to be here this morning. We have classroom teachers here. We have custodians here. Um, we have maintenance staff here. Um, we have administrators in the, in the room. We've invited food services people to be here as well because to design a school building takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, but most importantly, it takes a lot of input and a lot of thought from those people that are in the building day in and day out doing the work. And so the idea today is to share with us your thoughts on what you envision your particular space being, whether that's a custodial closet, that could be uh, a cafeteria setup, it could be a Title I reading classroom, social emotional wellness, it could be ELL, it could be a grade level teacher, it could be a special needs teacher. All of you folks have different needs. And the idea behind today is to take as much input as we can so that when we decide or start, excuse me, when we start to design a building model floor print, we can try to input as much of those thoughts and ideas into the building. And so the goals are separate for today and for the district. Um, we can probably say we're getting a K through five building which is very, very exciting. Um, the goal is to have it open for the start of the 2023 school year. So you folks have been around a while, I hope you can stick around a few more years and just find out and see the start of that school year. We're gonna keep you around, right? You gotta experience it once. And so that, that's the goal. And so throughout the course of the school year, we're gonna go through design process. And it's very, very tedious, very time oriented. Right now, we have some things going on behind the scenes. A lot of work being done as far as environmental studies. We have uh, phase one land studies being done. And so you've probably heard or seen surveyors in and around the buildings doing a lot of that behind the scenes work. And so that stuff's the fun part. Um, and this is even funner, to be able to take your guys' input and thoughts. And what's the overall goal? The overall goal is to provide a K through five building that is educationally stimulating, it's educationally exciting for not only students and staff, but it's something that the community can be proud of. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a custodian, if you're a classroom teacher, if you're food services, if you're a school board member, if you're an administrator, if you're a superintendent, the goal is to do what's best for kids. And that's hopefully, and I know we will, during these discussions today of what can we design that's gonna meet my needs to set me up for success, but also to leave a legacy not only for our kids now, but the kids in the future. Something the district and the community can be extremely proud of. That when they walk into the building, they are going to look at it and say, this is exactly what we designed, and this is what the architects and the construction manager at risk delivered. And it's keeping a promise of what, what we say and what we're gonna do. And I'm very, very excited about that. I don't know if my wife is excited about it, uh, <laughs> with the amount of work coming up. Be my third project. It's been a lot. So <clears throat> I have a lot less here than I used to. But I'm looking forward to it. And so today is about you guys and taking your thoughts and input on what this building is going to look like. So what we need you folks to be able to do is be comfortable being uncomfortable. So share with us your thoughts, your ideas, and don't hold back. Tell us exactly what you need to set you up for success. And then the idea is if you're set up for success, our kids are going to be successful. Do we have any questions before we get started? Oh, thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think that was very helpful. Let me make sure my screen is shared here. So then you know. um, the next thing we're going to go through is just a little bit more of me talking at you. So I apologize. I'll, I'll try to share. Um, Brian, does that look right now? I think I got it. Um, all right, the next thing we're going to do is just go through uh, some more idea starters. And this is more visual for all of you. So we're going to, after this, we're going to really start talking about what type of learning environments um, and what type of facilities would be helpful. We'll kind of walk through some different exercises to pull that information out, kind of what you have now, what works and doesn't work about it. And then how could that be improved in the future or what does that look like down the road in this new building? First, we're just gonna go through, um, I'm gonna go through some images and just kind of walk through fairly quickly some different examples of 
some projects. Some are Garmin Miller projects, some are not. Just kind of different types of spaces. So if you're thinking, what would that even look like if we want a multi-purpose learning studio or a lab or something, if you would want anything like that, what are some of those trends and some of those different um, high-performance learning environments that we see? So I'll go quickly, and it's really just to kind of help get, get some ideas going. The first one, um, most of all, we know that when we start out as a design team with the school district, and when we talk about high-performance learning environments or student-centered learning environments, what we really wouldn't think about is how we can best serve the students as well as support the teachers to make that education the best. So almost exactly what Justin had just said, how do we make this environment support all parties involved? Um, we want to thoughtfully provide space for a variety of activities. We know that your little kids are moving around all the time and you've got lots of different activities that you need the space to flex to do. So how do we make that easy, convenient, durable, um, and, as, and as successful as possible for you? Um, also, inspired and encouraged. So we just really want this building to be something that you're so proud of when you walk in it at the end of the day, that it reflects your community and kind of the whole spirit of Bethel. So we're going to be listening for those key indicators along the way as well. And with that, I just wanted this is a little, some of these are our projects, some are not, all just to get ideas. If you like things that are ours, great. If you don't like them, that's okay too. You won't hurt our feelings. <laughs> But this is Greenville Schools. I'm just stand over here so I'm not on camera. Because <laughs> it's cut uh, a little. Um, and Greenville Schools, this is uh, front entry, so a different secure environment and how they wanted to greet their students. A very flexible student dining that also has a stage on it. And the back of that stage opens up to a double sided gym so that you could have a performance or an announcement or uh, kind of an all student assembly um, on either side. They chose to do some flexible learning environments in their different uh, grade level pods. So they have kind of a hallway that opens up to one classroom or two classrooms. And so those partitions um, move quite a bit actually uh, based on how they use their space currently. This is just an example of um, different finishes and how you can use flexible furniture in different shapes and sizes and groups and configurations. An outdoor environment that also becomes part of the learning environment. So how easily can we get you a, a learning space that's outdoors? I know you all have been dealing with uh, kind of COVID policies and, and different ways to get creative, but this is just another idea outside of even coronavirus uh, conversations. But how do we bring the learning outside and use that as a tool too? This is right outside the art classrooms, science classrooms, things like that. Playgrounds, we'll talk about that. What would make your, your playgrounds and that experience even better? This is Kenton Elementary. This is their student dining, uh, student commons with a kind of performance stage platform as well. In their gym, you can see the same concept here where it opened up on their gym side too. A kindergarten classroom, just a lot of action going on and a lot of um, flexible furniture. They also had extended learning areas. You'll, you'll hear us say extended learning area or you'll see us as architects, we say ELA, and to us that means extended learning area. I know that means something different to you, <laughs> right? Like, uh, so I just wanted to, to get on the same lingo. I'm trying to not say ELA and assume that we're talking the same thing. But this is, uh, this large space has several classrooms, I think eight maybe, or more classrooms that open up onto this shared space. And they have um, some storage rooms, but then also some of their intervention specialists and some of their different specialized um, uh, teachers that have some storage and dedicated workspace out here. And it's really super flexible. And I've seen them use it um, in a number of ways here. This is a New Bremen Elementary. This is a, these are just renderings. This project just finished up and we haven't quite gotten photography done yet. But this is a, a different concept for a ELA, or Extended Learning Area, where they just wanted a place for students to present. 
and have the ability to meet in a small group up on that platform, but also have the ability to share concepts with their peers. So it's just a small uh, gathering and presentation space that also flexes a lot for their use. And you can see the classroom doors around the perimeter. And then if you turned around, there's also, if you have a couple students or a teacher aide and one student catching up on an assignment, there's kind of a heads down focus area in the same space. A media center that opens up to the exterior, but then also has a garage door to a computer lab. That just helps them use that space a lot more than um, as just as a library only. And this is an innovation studio or innovation center where they wanted community to be able to access. So you've got some different maker spaces in the back, more of a meeting and presentation room uh, here that you're seeing. This is Liberty Center Schools, as a science center. <laughs> uh, it's a little different concept here. Uh, they had a, a real uh, culture and desire in this school to kind of maintain more of a historical architecture that was reflected in some of their previous buildings. So we, we took those notes and designed for them. And again, this is a K-12 building, so it's a lot bigger than some of the others, but this is K-12. And their solution was, um, maybe a little, they knew that they wanted smaller areas, they weren't concerned with a large extended learning area, that wasn't the solution for them, but being able to have quick pull-out locations that were easily accessed off the corridor without taking a tremendous amount of square footage was really important for the school, so you'll see the floor plan down in the bottom right. And they had the same solution at their high school levels, we just furnished them differently. As you can see, furniture, equipment, all that can change the same type of space, same shape of space, much differently. This is Bayersville uh, Local Schools, also a K-12. Really important for them is to, was to have a really large presence at the front. I should actually probably have Casey and Hannah talk about this one. Um, this is their student commons, two stories. A lot of action can happen in here in terms of having a lunch hour, but then also having a whole second level where kids are working on um, assignments and group work. Thanks to you. Media Center, um, again, two stories, so it almost has a loft up those stairs that you see on the right. And again, they wanted to be able to have lots of different groups in the Media Center doing different types of activities at the same time. So they needed a place for their eighth grade Lego club to be in that space at the same time that kindergarten class was having story time. So there was a lot, um, a lot of flexible activity going on here. And this was their breakout spaces. <laughs> Those are high schoolers, very visible. They wanted to be very visible, but not in your own. <laughs> so, uh, but they had nice breakout spaces right off the corridors that were visible, but not overly loud. An art classroom. And a playground for them as well. Extended learning areas, this is where I usually have the ELA conversation. Um, but they have, it's kind of a broad term for just flexible space. Um, that's not necessarily called a classroom. So uh, you might hear us say it, but they take on many different forms. You can see here, this was an idea um, that's a little bit better visually, but they had a small group room with some different breakout spaces and all the doors along the side of the classroom. So a little different configuration for this pod. Again, a way to, to carve out that space and use it, but without using a huge amount of square footage um, is the right solution for other schools. We see a lot of kind of informal presentation spaces um, for teachers to use, obviously, but then also to kind of push and encourage your students to share their work and present to their peers as, as one of the goals for um, education as we go along. A lot of daylight, a lot of um, open walls, and um, encouraging students to kind of take ownership of the environment on their own.
Another thing we see a lot of, and um, you know, we talk to a lot of different school districts, but having ways to to constantly share the students' work with you know visitors who are walking through the building, but mostly their peers. You know, there's such a sense of pride when you see your own work in the hallway and display. But if it feels too formal in a display case, those often don't always get changed out as often as as everybody likes. So just having a way to take up a hallway space and and make it look nice, and the kids can share their own work. The tiered seating, it just for any age group, it's a it's a very flexible solution on how it can be used. And then maker spaces, um, another term that gets used a lot, but um, just kind of that hands-on work, whether it be in a science lab, an art classroom, or have its own specific lab space. And often we see those adjacent to media centers or just down the hallway or close by so that you can really start to have, um, kind of use all of those tools together and bring a class into a maker space. And of course, if there's 3D printers, if there's vinyl cutters, all those different tools that we can incorporate. Power, I think um, we hear that the most. Uh, if there's like a request that we hear is making sure there's outlets and power in all the most flexible locations. And storage, power and storage, yes. and staff restrooms. <laughs> Student commons. Um, this is just when, if the right solution is to combine your cafeteria with more of your front entry or more of a, a grand gathering space that your community might use. So thinking about how your school is used as you know visitors from the outside or different groups from the community and use it what's the right solution at that point so that's where we see a lot of different student commons um, come into play multi-purpose rooms that might not be a full-blown gymnasium competition gym but how can it be used for maybe some physical therapy occupational therapy but also maybe a gym class for some of the younger grade levels how can that type of a space be uh, multi-purpose and serve many functions this I just like to include because I think it's a super inspiring picture for just getting your kids excited about learning. So think about using every surface to convey the message and the concept. And natural light and materials have such an influence. Another student commons. Media centers. And then this we see a lot of um, kind of that presentation space um, with the, the large tiered steps uh, and being that getting included when you want to have a nice presentation area and really make the space take um, as many flexible functions as we possibly can. So you can see it's their student dining or cafeteria kind of in the back and they just carved out a little bit of that square footage that likely would have been circulation anyway as a presentation. And as you're thinking, if you come up with an idea like, no, this would be perfect, but I can't think of this, we need this very special table or this very special piece of equipment would just make my classroom the best thing ever. Um, it's probably out there. There's so many options. I just wanted to include a few pictures of different types of furniture and seating solutions and it's endless. So if you have an idea, just let us know. We want to know what would solve maybe an issue that you have or if it's so simple as a mobile cart of some sort it can be designed and it can be built. So don't, don't let something that you've just never seen before um, hinder any ideas you have. And this I would say is um, putting casters on almost everything and making it mobile to make the spaces flex is a request we often get. As well as making sure you think through that if it doesn't have, if it, something doesn't need its own room all the time, but can it be mobile, can it be pushed around and used by different um, classrooms, we can make it happen. So just trying to get you, get you ideas that might help um, solve any issues. Oh, that was a duplicate. Um, all right, so with that, that was really quick, just to kind of give you some ideas on uh, what to think about. But now it's time for group work. And then you get a break, I promise. 
after we make you talk to each other for a little bit. Um, so the first thing we're going to ask you to do, you're all at, I think we got eight different tables, I think, right? All right, so we talked about student-centered and high-performance learning, and what we really like to do is kind of have you walk through a typical day of, we're going to assign each group uh, to uh, one person to kind of put yourself in their <laughs> shoes and walk through their typical school day. So we're going to assign each table a different specific person. And the first thing we want you to do is kind of just write out what do they do. We'll assign the groups here in a second. For instance, what does a typical day look like for a kindergarten student? Current, your current state or your current, um, your current kindergarten student and walk through that. How do they get dropped off? Where do they go? Where do they put their stuff? Where do they move to? What happens when they have specials? Different things like that. So you'll walk, you'll just kind of outline that. And then what we want you to do, and it can be, it can be just a list. It can be a beautiful illustration if anybody's feeling extra artistic today and inspired based on the whiteboard video. But you're welcome to do that. Um, it can be whatever your group can help us to convey what that typical day looks like. And then when you find those spots that are problematic, we want you to think about what they're doing and where. We get that who are they with, what kind of tools or equipment are they using or not using. And then are they engaged or are they distracted or has this become a hindrance? And if you see something that's a problem or could be improved, bubble it, star it, underline it, things like that. So uh, I'll give you an example. A lot of times we'll hear um, that uh, students that get dropped off too early in the morning, where do they go? Where do they put their clothes or, when, or their coats with their backpacks? Are they outside? Are they allowed inside? Like what is that first five minutes even on campus? What do they do at that point? What could be a solution for that? Another example that I would say we see a lot is maybe a specials or an intervention specialist who doesn't have a dedicated uh, classroom maybe. How do they get their materials uh, to different classrooms? Where do they put it? How do they move through the building? Things like that. So those are just a couple examples to give you, but I'll go back to our list. So the first group gets a kindergarten student. Let's see, I would like a kindergarten teacher to be on my group at least. So let's see. Do we have a kindergarten? Where are my kindergarten teachers? You guys want kindergarten students? Okay, you guys will be group one back there. You'll be kindergarten students. So if you can think through what the typical day of a kindergarten student looks like. Um, who are my intervention specialists? Do you guys want intervention? Yes. Okay, a, a typical day of what you do and how you move through the building and interact with the different teachers, the students, and all that. Um, who are my first grade teachers? That, I saw your hand go up first. You guys want to do first grade? As a first grade teacher now, so you can just kind of walk through your day and what are your um, issues or what things work really well that you want to keep. Uh, my next grade is a, a second grad student. I don't know who that is. <laughs> I think we got the wrong, gosh, I just did not learn how to spell, apparently. So, who are my second grade teachers? Okay, so you can hear that. So think of a, a second grade student that um, might have some learnings, learning issues or had to go to different specials, and that would be helpful to think through that. Where are my fifth grade teachers? I was very energetic. <laughs> All right, you guys got a fifth grade student. Thank you. All right, who are my food service? Do we have anybody from food service? Okay, how about custodial? Yeah, you want to kind of take it from the viewpoint of, of what you do every day and what makes your job easier or not easier. <laughs> uh, an occupational therapist, do we have any OTs or PT or speech therapists? Do we have any other special like art? Yeah. yeah. What do you guys have? You guys want that one? Okay, that'd be great. A special teacher and then a media center specialist. Do we have a media center specialist here? 
Who is not assigned yet? Okay. Okay. So maybe I'll Okay, I'll put the questions back up here and we will have you got about 15 minutes. I'll just kind of take 15, 20 minutes. I'll keep an eye on everybody to see when conversations wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm putting it out. Oh, and my wallet is like, you can set your gold twice. Okay, no. Okay. 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 Say so you want in on this? You guys all come up here. Because instead of just me, me. No, you should sit down. I have to do this. Real work. Seriously. Sit down. It's like she's saying, well, you should go for us and whatnot.
the cart size and the number of carts, so um, holds enough stuff and an appropriate number. Uh, the closed ceilings are easier because you don't have to clean the open area when it's closed. And the block walls are easier to clean than the elementary, which is like drywall. Like drywall. So um, <laughs> the, the new school with the blocks is easier. So that was the working well. Right. That's the well. Here's the good news. Here we go. Things that could be improved. So more storage space and in multiple locations and bigger storage. So this is all because there's more travel time, right? If you're running back and forth to get things from a, a smaller location, from not as many locations. And then in the smaller location, a lot of times they have to move the parts out to get the things behind it. So a bigger space would be better. Less glass, I guess anybody who has a house would get this right. Less glass, less fingerprints, less cleaning. Uh, less carpet in the kindergarten. Um, less, less <laughs> Smaller kids are messier, right? So it would be easier if there wasn't a carpet to be in, the, in those rooms. Um, separating K2 from 3 to 5. So the conversation was here was maybe having a separate wing off like a common area or something. Um, just again, because the lower grades are messier, so you kind of contain that mess in the area. Um, related to the bathrooms, bigger trash cans, bigger rolls of toilet paper, uh, having an air dryer for students instead of paper towels because the paper towels wind up everywhere, including in the toilets and you know, on the walls and stuffing things up. Um, paper towels for the staff, of course. <laughs> And an elevator in the elementary would be nice because right now they're, of course, carting things up and down the stairs to get to the various floors. Does anybody else have anything to add or comment on those? Thank you for studying. I the applause. Okay, great. I'm going to go this way. I think fifth grade looks like they're working. Can this group share? Who would like to be your speaker? <laughs> okay, so in intervention land, a lot of the aides or the teachers usually have a rival duty, and that seems we start that as a big concern because right now all the kids go to the auditorium, it's a lot of travel time from their cars to the auditorium, a lot can happen. Not a lot of supervision out in the hallway, so um, it would be great, like we saw in the video, maybe to have an area that had the glass windows that you could see the cars come, let them stay in that cafeteria area or whatever um, would be good. Then I usually do like a listening check sometimes for hard of hearing kids or whatever. Um, we didn't start that as an area of concern because usually it's the beginning of the day and I can do that one on one easily. Then I do pull out for English language arts. I know other intervention specialists might be doing math or um, social skills groups, things like that. Um, and sometimes during that time, you have multiple groups going on and we have a small space. So we start that because we're dealing with the kids that have ADHD, autism, you know, behavior issues. And it's really hard when you have an ADHD kid with a kid that has autism that's throwing tantrums on the other side of the room and you're trying to keep this ADHD kid going as well. Um, so to have a space that's big enough for multiple groups, to have a space that has different furniture in it so that you can have a collaboration area as well as independent seating um, would be great. To have multiple boards would be great so you can have two groups going at the same time. So we start that as, a, as an area of concern that we don't have. Um, another thing intervention specialists like I do is sometimes we're not the teaching the whole class. Like we're not just the reading teacher or just the math teacher. They're having those classes in their regular ed classroom and we're just providing the intervention. And so we said it would be great if we could limit that traveling time. Because right now all the kids are traveling to our resource room and that takes time when you only get 20 minutes or 30 minutes with them. And five of those minutes are wasted getting there and another five are wasted getting back. So then you're even limiting that time even more. So we said it would be great to have central locations in different, like the kindergarten meeting, have a central location, the first grade, the second grade. So just as intervention specialists are moving to that space, 
and then the intervention kids are coming to that space and it's, it cuts down a lot of that traveling time um, and to consider that. Um, also, some of us are going in for inclusion or have aides going in to classrooms for inclusion. Um, we start that because, you know, the general ed teachers spoke up here um, that it would be great if in their classrooms were big enough to have small groups going on. Um, they're limited in space, and right now with the small groups going on, it's very distracting for other class members. It's not far enough away. They don't have that space. They said it would be great to have testing areas outside the room. Um, because a lot of times the intervention specialist or even you guys for 504 students have to have that space to pull kids out and limit distractions and provide that small group. Um, they said that it would be great if they had multiple boards in their classroom. So if, a, if an aide comes in or an intervention specialist is coming in to co-teach, they can say, hey, we, you can work over here with this small group. Well, I work with this small group, especially on like Saturdays and things like that are happening. Um, and right now they're, it's limited because there's only one board um, to display information. Um, and sensory spaces, they said it would be very important to have those for the kids who need sensory breaks. Um, and right now they don't have that space. Um, and then the other thing we do is that dismissal duty. And we are saying we need a space, especially for, again, those weather conditions. When it's raining, when it's snowing, right now we're trying to get kids to come outside to communicate that, and it's just a lot, um, and it takes a lot of time to try to get the kid out there and listen to their last name and all that. So to consider a space that you know would be easier for arrival duty, dismissal duty. Does anybody else have anything that they want to comment or share about that? That was great. All right, I'm going to go back to fifth grade. Y'all done yet? Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got a fifth grader. Obviously, the fifth grade teachers are artistic, but don't like public speaking. <laughs> we all know I have no problem with that. So I'm going to do that for them. So we're going to start out as a fifth grade student when they are getting to school down here on the bottom. If you're a bus rider, um, some great things about it is that it's, it's pretty efficient. They all come in at one time. They're safe. They're in the back of the school. Um, so we can reduce um, a lot of some of this, those safety concerns. They're well supervised and it's predictable. The kids know what to do um, and, and where to go when that happens. The problem with that is that they are all smushing through one door. Some of them actually see that there's a second door that they could go in if they take a longer route, but they don't want to do that, so they all smush through one door. Um, getting 700 kids in through one door is, is tough right now. Um, the in and out and in and out, we tried to include the kind of getting to school and arrival. So for a fifth grade student, they are going in the building, turning, going out of the building, turning, mapping around, and going in the modulars, to get into their classroom and the same thing when they um, leave. For car riders, um, there is no smushing. Woo! We've got a good system going on um, in the morning. We've got a good, a good flow um, so far, but they're safe, they're efficient, they're well supervised. The, the problem is the maze they go through. They get here, then they have to go in the building. We need to have people at different stations leading them and guiding them up the stairs in the main building to the elementary. Um, another problem is that the kids are bored. Um, you know, we're super excited that Mrs. Rest is, is showing videos and, and doing things to try to get them um, a little bit more engaged. Thank you. Um, but, you know, some of them are sitting for up to 40 minutes right now in the auditorium, in those seats. Um, so we would love to have, similar to what someone else has said, if it was a, a space off of this where they could come, maybe sit with um, sit with friends, do some sort of bad homework or any other kind of work, you know, we would love that as well. Um, at traffic, we are now at 40 minutes to reduce traffic because we will literally block 201 all the way down um, for car riders and at drop off. So we need more space for them to be able to wrap around our facility to make it more efficient. Um, so that we can reduce some of that time. And also the, the weather, we talked about that. They're uncovered for both buses and 
um, car riders, especially with car riders, they won't get out of the car. We go and we open the doors for them to make them get out of the car and parents get a little upset with us sometimes because it's raining and they don't want their kids to walk and we get it. But only letting two kids out at a time is tough. So it keeps our line moving slow. So if we had some sort of covered option, then we could have five or six cars dismissing at one time and so forth. So then they head into the school and they go to their cubbies. Um, fifth grade has cubbies because they're in the modulars this year. They have previously had lockers. Um, the good part about cubbies is that they're supervised. They don't have to fiddle with locks. And that it's pretty efficient if you need something out of it. Um, some problems with that is it's very cluttered themselves aren't really big enough for their, their stuff that they have. Um, it's exposed, you know, by fifth grade. They have stuff that's important to them and others, you know, they may be concerned about it coming up missing. Um, they also take up a lot of space in the classroom, which, you know, is precious to us. Then they move into their instruction. Um, some pros for that is that we have both tech and paper options, um, especially with, you know, adding more Chromebooks for classrooms. It's, it's been great. Um, to be able to incorporate that. We, they have, staff has the parts for their um, computers and their pods with other classes. This is why I went to the bathroom, you wanna elaborate? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll let you know that part, sorry. So instructional wise, we are able to keep all of fifth grade together. So locally, you know, they're right next to other teachers if they need something or things like that. So the delta is that we do not have enough space. Um, we want more space so that we can have collaboration for students, similar to having small group areas where they could break off and be able to do that. Hearing the materials is very cumbersome for fourth and fifth grade students. You know, when they're switching three classes, they're carrying lots and lots of things. Um, and, you know, to have a space where they could, could do that. Also traveling or smushing through the same hallway four or five classes at a time to be able to switch to their departmentalized. So there's definitely some areas for improvement. Um, at recess, our playground with uh, the new high school wing is amazing. Kids, you know, were really engaged. We're sad that the rock play area was gone. The kids did love that. Um, but overall, the, the new playground equipment is fabulous. This year, we have a lack of space being on the football field, obviously, um, but even on the playground under non-COVID issues, there's still a lack of space with the number of grade level, the number of students in each grade level. Um, you know, there was a time where we used to have up to three grade levels out there at one time playing together, which is great for siblings. But now, you know, two grade levels is up to 300 students. And even on the new playground, which is amazing, that's a lot of kids. And, and it gets scary um, to make sure that they are well supervised and also have the space to run and get the energy out without hurting each other. Indoor recess in general is just not good. We would like to get them outside more often. Um, a blacktop space area is something that we used to have. Um, we would love to have a blacktop space area to come back so that we can be outside more often. Um, or a second gym or a second space large gross motor area. For specials, um, a big pro right now is the library. Going back to the library, we're excited to start in quarter two. Um, the library itself is a great space. It looks very much like a lot of the pictures that you share as it was newly renovated. Um, I don't see renovated, but updated. Um, and it's a great space for kids. It has a lot of the features that we would like to see. Um, and that all of our specials are still available for students. Our specials have, our students have five specials, one each and every day, um, which is great for them. To negatives, right now, um, all but two of them for second quarter are in the classroom and that's really cumbersome, of course. When we were traveling, they're very far away. Um, so we take up a lot of transition time. And we need space for growth. Some of their rooms are very small, and as we have class, group, class sizes up to 30, it's really tough. For lunch, you're sitting in it. We have lots and lots of area. It's a very efficient line, and it's very spread out. We like the addition of um, with the COVID protocol spreading the kids out more. We love, we found a lot of positives with the students being spread out and not smushed together. Um, the problem is that the cafeteria is way too far away. We lose a lot of instructional time and transition. Um, we are disrupting 
with the middle school and high school, their classes, and they're also causing some disruption to our efficiency and getting here and, and everything. Um, and then sharing high school bathrooms down the hallway is also something we would like, um, which will naturally take care of itself, but a delta. And then they, we've, we've already gone over that. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Does anybody have anything to add to fifth grade? Good. Okay. Here's my group over here. Media <laughs> As they were just saying, this is for the media center that it has been updated lately. We were just one positive, obviously. We are going back to the library. We'll be ready to check out books. We know that's not happening yet. Um, some things that just go on. We know that she's reading books, she does different activities with the kids. We have the social emotional lesson. Is that whatever? Depend on grade levels. She's in, uh, Sarah's in there helping as well. Um, we have the flexible seating. They have the Lego walls and some of those things that we definitely didn't have room for in our old library. Um, just some things we weren't sure about. I don't know whether she has like the projector and so forth. Does she? Oh, so she just got it. Okay, because some of the things I know she's doing in the classrooms, I think she'd probably want to do them, but she didn't have the means before. Um, the checking out books and returning books area, she needs an area, not <laughs> just right at that door. Um, we're saying the laminator needs to be moved to the, the teacher workroom. She shouldn't be responsible for that. We need a teacher workroom. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she shouldn't be responsible for that. That's just something, since I've been here, the librarian's always been here. It's one of those things. That's what I thought I um, and just storage, because right now I know she uses some of the old uh, kitchen to put things in. And that, let me tell you, I can clean it in the summer. It's gross in there, or it was. Um, and we also didn't know as far as some of the activities that she does, whether materials, more things she could add to that. And then again, needing the storage for that. Done. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Anybody else have anything to add to your media center? All right. Great. All right. So. All right. So I would like a morning meeting area. Because right now we are crammed at the front since we're all spread out. And I love the collaboration desks. My only complaint with the ones I have that are trapezoid that is when they are put together, they're such a big circle, they have to shout clear across the to talk to the other group. Um, so I would like to something different with that. Um, storage area, in my room I have a lot, but I know my cohorts, colleagues do not but my room was more remodeled recently. So I have storage area. But when we come down here for lunch, they have to sit on their coats because there's no place to put them. And we have milk spilled a lot, so that's a problem. Um, I would love to have an ELA area out right outside our doors so the kids could do their small groups with um, someone out there. And I would like a mobile cart to be able to send that stuff out. So, um, I would love to have a sink in the classroom with a water station filler so that I do not have to send them 20 million times to the restroom, which then takes about 10 minutes to try to find them back. <laughs> which puts me, and I want a close proximity to the restroom for all the restroom accidents that we have down in the first student kindergarten. So, and I would like, um, oh, I have the cabinets and the others don't. And then a lot more outlets because I have one with the projector and then one with my computer and that's it. So outlets. I would love to have a magnetic whiteboard yes, because sir. mine is not magnetic. Yeah. <laughs> I love my smartphone and I want I like my amplifier that I get to wear every day, okay. especially now that I have the masks. Oh, everybody wants a whiteboard. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to make sure we keep our small group table. Kidney shape is fine. Um, they talk, we talked about chairs with water bottle holders so that the water bottles are not on their desks. I like my bottle stools. Um, that is very good for my autistic and ADHD kids. And a recessed storage bin because I'm tired of the balls rolling all over my classroom all day long. <laughs> She got the closest thing to a standing ovation by saying my magnetic marker board. So, let me understand. So you have a smart, you have a smart board projector. What does everybody have one of those? No. <laughs> you don't have magnetic marker. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you have whiteboards, but they're not making it. Or you have chalk. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That just helps me understand some of the comments. Okay. That's great. You almost got to see any Yeah. All right. We have a second grade. All right, so yes, we have a second grader, but he's also an intervention student. And um, so, if you guys know who's in my class and who I've had in my classroom for the past three years, you know which second grader I have in mind. Um, so, we'll just walk through his day. Um, and so, some of the comments are similar to what other people said, but um, the first part just arriving from the bus and going to the classroom. Um, so one of the things was, yeah, direct route to the classroom, so there's less time to wander and um, meander um, to wherever he pleases. Um, so one of the things, too, we talked about was that there was a potential to have breakfast at the school, so just maybe arriving right into the cafeteria and getting that started right away as a wait area, um, which someone else had mentioned, just having that wait area to, like, sit and do work and stuff. Um, then when he gets to my classroom, um, he immediately asks to go to the bathroom. So the long commute to the bathroom and then back to my classroom is another point where he just goes wherever he wants and there's no one to be able to watch him, but he has to go down three flights of stairs to get there and come back. Um, so just having bathrooms closer would be awesome. Um, and then he goes down to the intervention room, which is also three flights of stairs away. Um, but we were talking, and I know after you guys talked, um, if the classrooms are in pods by grade level, even having like the intervention classes connected within those pods or something so that they can easily get to kindergarten pod or first grade pod um, or second grade pod, however that works, um, just for that less transition time, but also being able to have their own space um, and within that space, um, having separate spaces in the intervention classrooms, especially for a sensory area or room for having brain breaks. Um, so even if those kids are in the classroom but need a break, it's easy to get to it, but they also have a safe space to calm down and things like that in all of those um, intervention rooms. And then when we were talking about recess, um, we talked about a little bit about how it'd be nice one of the group members said it'd be nice to have green space. But looking at the pictures of the recess places, it would actually be nice to have that surface that they had just so that if it did rain, we could still go out and it wouldn't be muddy. We wouldn't have to deal with mulch or rocks or things like that. Because we, yeah, we don't like indoor recess. Um, and then, yeah, the transition time as well, just having it central. Um, and then different, recess spaces for different grade levels, just so the equipment is fit for the different sizes of children, whereas a kindergartner and first grader would need smaller equipment and fourth and fifth graders need larger equipment. So even having like two separate recess like spaces would be nice. And then we could schedule recesses at the same time and they could be out there and there'd be less chaos. Um, and then we have small group time. And I also included at this point that he sometimes gets pulled out for speech, OT, and PT. Um, it'd be great as well if they could have central locations because they work with all grade levels um, and needing their own space. Um, right now, they just kind of are working in the hallways. 
And so like they're practicing dribbling balls and balancing and skipping and jumping for PT. And um, so they would need a space for that. But even if they had a space nearby for again, the, the less transition time. Mm -hmm. um, and then for occupational therapy, they really just need a spot to like sit and be able to write. And so if that was within that pod, if there was a small work area that they could take them, um, whether it be in that extended learning area that's open or if there's like just a small office space that can be utilized for one or two kids at a time um, would be nice. And then within that small group time, having a spot in the classroom for um, when aides and intervention specialists come in or um, the title teacher could come in and have their own small group within your classroom um, and the teacher having their own small group. Um, and then, so yeah, within the classroom and just outside of the classroom for like pulling out for tests, but also being in the classroom, just like getting that one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one support. Um, lunch, as everyone has said, just less transition time to get there and back would be great. Um, having specials central as well, those transition time is also what we talked about there. And then, um, the class time, um, as well as the intervention teachers having areas for sensory breaks, maybe in that extended area having some ex sensory um, resources for all the kids, just being able to go and do, um, I don't know, the walking things that they haven't, we have them in the kindergarten hallway right now, but just little things that they can do in the hallways mm -hmm. just to kind of get moving and stuff. Um, and then, um, for dismissal, we had the same comment as fifth grade about having the, their things in a space that we can supervise them when they have to go out in the hallway. It's difficult to supervise them and um, deal with that kind of thing, but um, having their stuff in the classroom, but not taking up your whole wall and um, storage spaces that you could be using for other things. Okay. That is our Second grade intervention student. Awesome. Great. Anybody have any comments on that one? Great. Everybody's doing a very thorough job. Um, specials changed a little bit this year. So right now, my, my process is I come in, I have some coffee, I go to seventh grade in my room. With Rackham Hearts, I do that for a little bit. That's a lot of fun. Um, then I walk with the K, fourth, third, etc. Um, usually, my day is you bring the kids to me, I make a big mess, I rinse them off, and then I repeat that the rest of the morning. This year, just me and the music teacher are doing that. And the media, which is in. She has actually her own room, which is pretty darn nice. <laughs> Um, I know if I was going to pick things that I wanted, I would just like to make the whole cleanup process a little bit better. So tables that are nice and big with simple legs to sweep around, um, double sinks, you know, one a little bit lower for the little kids because I have to have them get up on a box to get their hands cleaned at the end. Two would be nice. That would be kind of pleasant. Um, other than that, just a room that's easily cleaned and put stuff away. I think everybody agreed, fifth grade, fourth grade, that a way of depositing coats and storage for things would be a great benefit to them to make the room look a little bit better. Um, for the music teacher, I will get Would you like? Um, you can't tell them more. Yeah. <laughs> I would just love a room. <laughs> um, we were discussing it would be great if um, all the special um, spaces were in the same area. Um, also thinking about um, for performances, the um, elementary students have a lot of musical performances with choirs and their grade level performances may be somewhere close to a performance space if that is going to be an option in a cafeteria. Um, some sort of way to project music easily, some sort of speaker system would be great. Um, but yeah, just to yeah, I just want a doorknob. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just turn it down like that. I got a chain, a padlock. <laughs> doorknob. 
arm and the cost effective. Um, it will be fun to have one gym um, instead of back and forth. And I bet that one gym would be as safe as the middle school gym instead of walls that I think each day get closer <laughs> to each other. It's like, a, it's like a survival game. <laughs> we did talk a lot about also, and I think this affects everybody, and I don't know why we thought of it the most, like a big giant work area um, and then a separate lounge area to eat, get coffee. Yeah, we do not have that close to us at all. Um, the other thing that I thought of, maybe music tipped me off, I could envision um, pushing play and somebody else is instructing the yoga workout every now and then. So I think it'd be fun with a gym that, that could project videos and also show like different games that they've never seen before. Um, just for a couple minutes to expose them to those kind of things. So that isn't on there, but I think that'd be a lot of fun to be able to use that technology resource in a gym. And I think that's all that matters a lot. Okay. So, is there any yeah, that's a, a low bar. We can uh, yeah, we said a teacher workspace. Um, we said maybe bathrooms for each grade level or a pod. Sometimes they're traveling really far away to get to the bathroom. All other playground, flexible learning areas. Um, Derek said a loading dock. He would like loading. Um, <laughs> um, closer staff parking. And then we said maybe, especially if it's staff parking. Yeah, like a four minute walk. Yeah. 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 But the storage room and closet, like in the classroom, especially for like if you're teaching science, you have a lot of things. It would be nice to have like storage everywhere, like a little storage room, closet that you can store things and stuff like that. Oh, well, yeah. oh, more than one copier in our, um, in our coffee room. Yeah. Large teacher work area, more than one copier, one more than one microwave. So. Yeah. Simple. Thank you. Ta-da! <laughs> okay, so we were doing kindergarten, and there was a little user error with the marker, so I apologize about that. Um, we have our schedule here. It's hard to read because I'm sorry, should we read through? All right, basically, the kids get dropped off in the auditorium. If they get here early, we obviously know that. So we have a little sad face by that. Um, we'd maybe like the kids to have a more central location, or a better location, even you mentioned the uh, cafeteria. Then they transition to the classrooms, we put a sad face there too. Some of the kindergartners like get lost on accident or intentionally and are in other areas of the building except for our classrooms. So sometimes we're hunting down kids. Um, and from 8.45 to 9, they're unpacking and we're taking attendance. We're doing collaboration bins. It'd be nice to have storage for that, I guess. Um, and they're taking bathroom breaks and we're doing RTI. So it'd be nice to have like a space for, I think we took this on a later page, but um, for, what did we say? Small group intervention space, more flexible space and seating for that. Sometimes it's difficult for a person, that, if it's Mr. G helping with the RTI, it's hard to work there when we have such a small space in our classroom and it's noisy. Um, and then they have their cubbies and their desks and their chairs and tables um, that they're using. From 9 to 10, 15, we have a sad face for wit and wisdom is, um, during that time. And the kids are in their seats. Um, partly we have a sad face because the curriculum is pretty heavy for kindergarten at this point. It's taking us multiple days to do one lesson. Um, but we use our projector and the whiteboard, as mentioned before, we, I think we all have magnetic whiteboards in kindergarten, but I don't know, personally, a smart board would be nice and projectors are great. Um, and I obviously have a microphone. 
I know a lot of other people express like having some kind of amplification system would be nice. Um, then we move into volume of reading, and at this point, we just do various activities depending on the needs of our students. But they're again at their desk, and once a week, we have a special at that time. So even having like consistent special times would be great because then we could work as a team during that time for plan time. 10.45 to 11 is our snack time. What? Oh, it'd be great to have like a carpeted area and then a tile area. So when they eat their snack, it's not getting all on the carpet or we're crafting or painting, it's not getting all on the carpet or massive amount of spills from water bottles. So the water bottle holders on the chairs would be nice. Or rooms are flooding, it'd be nice to have a tile area. <laughs> Um, you never know. Or a student goes and pees in the cubby. It'd be nice to have Tyler up there. Um, just saying. <laughs> throwing that out there. Um, and then from 11 to 11.30, we do foundations at their desk. Again, so we're at their desk a lot. There's, our classrooms are obviously not that big, so there's not a lot of space to go within our room, especially with COVID going on, you can't utilize the carpeted area and have them all sit together. Um, but in general, pre-COVID, it'd be nice to have a bigger area for like our morning meeting or reading books. Um, then we do math at our desk again, and then we transition to lunch, which is a dreaded part of the day. Um, the transition to lunch is obviously like a 45 minute walk that we'd like to cut down a little bit. Um, and then in the lunchroom, um, it's okay. <laughs> but then after lunch, transitioning back, kindergarten, you can probably hear them all the way down in the elementary building. They're waiting in the hallway. We do the best that we can, but they're waiting there for us to come pick them up. And then we're trying to find lost kids. So <laughs> um, yeah, that needs to be, I don't know what we could do with that, but something. So, and then we go back to our classrooms and do we, we do Hegarty and that's fine. They're just at their seats. That's fine for that. It's a short amount. It's like 10. Sorry. My back towards you. Um, and then we do another transition to recess. And obviously this year with hashtag COVID, we are walking to the football field, which is pure chaos. And then out to the soccer fields, is it? I like the soccer fields, but obviously because of COVID, that's why we're out of the football field. It's great that we can still take them outside. But um, recess is great, but at the same time, it would be nice to have an area that's more like a, of a blacktop like that was shown in those pictures because a lot of times we still have to have indoor recess because it's too muddy. Um, and whoever mentioned like the different playgrounds for different grade levels, I think is a fabulous idea. Um, fifth graders and kindergartners probably would enjoy different equipment. Um, and then if we had that laptop, we could just get outside more often and let them run and play with their mask off. <laughs> um, and then we're transitioning back to our classroom. Um, and transitions are, I think, tough for everyone, especially this year, because we're going through the gym, the hallways, and it's disruptive to uh, the floor of the are out there, constantly cutting through. Um, and then we go to specials, four out of five of us go to specials at 2 to 225, and they're in our classrooms, and obviously you guys discussed um, that already. And we transition back from specials if they were out of our room. And then 230 to 250, we're doing like centers or Chromebooks, um, and I think that time's fine for us. And then we're packing up, getting their things out of the cubbies, cleaning up their room, and then transitioning to the buses. Um, here are some things that we mentioned that I may have already mentioned them before. More storage. I know kindergarten does have, well, most of our classrooms have the cabinets, which is great. So, but even more storage would be nice. Like one of my closets is tech stuff, which is awesome. But um, we mentioned the carpeted tile area. More flexible space um, and seating. It's just there's, they're five and six. There's just, our desks are there and it's, there's not a lot of space to have them go on the ground and work. Like during recess for my class, we like back all the desks up on one side and the other side so they have a little bit more space um, to play and collaborate. Um, and then, oh, yes. 
bathrooms. We like more bathrooms. A lot of times they are not functioning well. Um, thank you for fixing the sinks, Todd. Give a shout out to Todd. Um, sometimes the kids would run back to the room with a handful of soap and say, I was thankful they had the soap on the rings, but I'd say the sinks weren't working. So then we have to use the sink in our classroom. And I have a student who like throws crayons down there and it clogs. So yeah. Um, <laughs> we would like more sinks in there. And we have a little nose here because if you haven't been down to the bathrooms by the kindergarten, you could probably smell it from your classrooms. It reeks of stale urine. Um, so if we could get some kind of like ghostbuster thing that sprays every time a kid leaves the room with floral scent, kind of like pumpkin spice maybe in the fall, that'd be great. Um, so add that note. That's a start note. Closer cafeteria we mentioned, more space for movement, indoor and outdoor class size. Um, we are kind of referring to the size of our classrooms, but then we just have a lot of students in our classrooms. Our um, district is booming, so smaller class sizes would be great, but that's not obviously speaking to. Um, small group intervention space, um, a bigger teacher workroom, more copiers, um, maybe some gumball machines and a nice new machine, that'd be fine too. Um, we put Spanish down here. Um, Spanish is great for the kids. They seem to enjoy it, but our ELL kids do miss out on that. So that was, again, not in the building plan, but just um, maybe having a fifth special where they can join in. And I think, does anyone else have anything to share from my group? No, I think that'll be all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else have anything from the larger group to add to kindergarten or comments? Okay, that was great. That was a ton of information. Um, thanks to all the groups. I promised a break and I will deliver. So if you guys want to take a, like a five minute break um, and then we'll move on to the next activity. Thank you. but if we have smart like you know something that was yeah the kids will walk up so they can move and do steps because then it's easy to see our overdose have reading they do a lot of action out in story in our reading So nice. And I know something that will help my clothes that day. I mean, at least with fifth grade, like, have those walls and the way they have women on five. Yeah, it doesn't even sure. have to be soundproof. Yeah, the sixth grade are using them. Make sure they're open all the time. Mm -hmm. awesome. Kings. Love it. But it'd be nice for a pod to be able to open up to. I didn't put that in. If you wanted to say something to all of fifth grade, we could all open. Well, and that's the, what was on that. I don't remember which building it was, but they like all opened up into the one space. Yeah, I love that. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it got on the text, so. Yeah. But that was Thank great. Thank you.
Okay, it's a four minute warning. I think uh, 10 after we'll get started.
But I think what would be really helpful, we, we're kind of hearing some consistent feedback about certain areas, certain desires, or certain needs, um, and maybe kind of dig a little deeper into those spaces specifically, or those solutions. So think about kind of a key area or a key need that you really mentioned, maybe it's more intervention space, uh, spaces or what a sensory room means to you guys, or you know, the, the, something like that. Pick a space or pick a solution, um, or like you mentioned, a pod, what would all be in that pod, what does that mean? Um, so pick what does the doorknob exactly look like to you? More detail. If it could be more detailed and exactly how you control it, take a few minutes to really detail it out for us. Um, but anyway, really pick kind of a key topic, and if it's a list of what equipment or what goes into that space or what it's adjacent to, kind of really give us a solution. There was a group that was pretty, um, that got almost a standing ovation for a teacher workroom or a teacher workspace and lounge. Like, what exactly does that look like? How does this get supported? Where is it best located in the building? Does this make sense? Maybe a little deeper dive in one key area. We make sure everybody's doing something different, so not everybody has a work um, <laughs> <laughs> We can, we can. Um, let's see, how's the best way to do this? We're kind of changing up our uh, original plan, so I'm trying to think of how we can coordinate everybody. Um, but for Media Center, I guess what would, can you think of what your topic might be? Yeah, we need a checkout process. You guys mentioned that was um, or it doesn't work. So let's do that. Fifth grade? Like, you know, like, okay, for what grade level? Uh, okay, they're gonna they're gonna do a pod based on kind of conceptualize from the intervention side of things. So I think that'll look different than others. If you guys, if you guys want to make a list, uh, it were to be like a real focus on what you do, like materials you like or don't like to clean, or issues you have and don't like, that could be a good idea. Something to look That group is doing kindergarten classes. That was the same thing all they're doing kindergarten. Yeah. 
Okay. Are we ready to share? Okay, we're going to try to keep this. I know, I know you guys are really excited. Um, I'm excited to see it. There's drawings. I love to see those too. So, smiley faces, multiple marker colors. Everyone's excited. So, um, what I would like to do is start with one group that is ready to share, and we're going to try to keep it. Um, just a couple minutes, and I know there'll be discussion afterwards for sure, but um, can we get one group that volunteers to go first? Yes, okay, here we go. Um, we, had, we, we did, took on recess, um, and so of course we're dreaming big, obviously, but um, we realized that recess equipment costs a lot of money too. So. Um, for outdoor recess, um, we talked about the rubber surface, um, which would be less maintenance. Um, but we were just wondering if it could be cleared of snow or if it would have water puddles on it, just depending on how it was set up. Um, we talked about having um, the exit straight to the recess area, so that way um, they exit the doors and they don't have to like travel out to the fence area. They can just walk right into it, especially for the younger kids, just for safety reasons. And then the other kids, if there's just an easy hallway, that they can get to it and then get right to the recess area. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about how utilizing that space for multiple things and potentially since um, we're gonna have a separate space than the high school and the buses will kind of still park here, potentially, I don't know. Um, the, bus drop off and pick up area could be utilized as both a recess area and the bus pick up drop off area potentially. And then of course having things sized for different ages would be great as well and potentially having two separate areas. And then we talked about indoor recess as well, just being able to have a space for a whole grade level to go so that they can all be supervised um, at the same time and not interrupt like our general routine. And um, really dreaming big, just having the, all that indoor recess equipment there, being able to store games, um, having areas for kids to play games at, little tables even, having technology in that room so that they can watch videos and get up and dance or something. And yeah, that's what we came up with for recess. Thank you. Is it drawing? I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love it. Anybody have anything they want to add to that one? All right. Well, this is super helpful. We'll move on to another group over here, uh, morning meeting area. Hey, we're having a morning meeting. We want tiered seating with storage included in it. Um, TV, monitor, technology, anything that we could use like that. Flat boards, they could be the cushion kind or the pillow kind. Um, we want windows nearby so that we can check the weather every morning. We want a fish tank and a waterfall and a sensory area. <laughs> and then we have like a greenery area where we can have a garden or like an area so that we can work on all of that. Not too much to ask. Fish tank, doorknob. We're, we're on our way. <laughs> Oh, so that's great. Yes. Thank you. All right. Go to the special areas. You don't have to go. You can see it. Huh? <laughs> okay. So um, we talked about having some sort of central location, so that's why it's easier for all students to access um, all of the specials. Um, we talked about having a place for us to collaborate as specials as a whole as well, so for art and music to collaborate if needed, or sometimes uh, for gym and music to uh, collaborate. Sometimes I do dances with the kids. Um, we use computers and music a lot, so 
just a little space or a recording space for them to have um, a performance and a place for them to uh, make things and create things together. Lots of places to display their work for art, music, gym, anything that they create, a place to have those displayed out for um, everyone to see. Um, some sort of amplifier for each room so because we have larger spaces to for all those kids to have so we can talk and not scream all day. <laughs> um, a projector for the gym especially, a large place to project. Um, and for about the bar rooms as well. Sinks, especially in the art room, there's paint stuff to wash your hands and things. And uh, even in the music room, kids drop recorders, they put them in their mouth and like them on the floor and put them in other places. Um, sound control, oh, and storage. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and Yes. <laughs> awesome. And we also worked, you guys also worked on a workroom? No? That's all right. Um, you guys worked here? Did I? Nobody else did a workroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's your dreams. We put in, um, oh, look, we even did a doodle. Okay. We just have like multiple copiers. We have some tables, some work areas. So you have places to sit your stuff. We also included a, uh, included a storage room for all the papers, so we're not lugging it up in the basement. So just a nice big storage, lots of storage, lots of room to work. Bulletin boards, whiteboards, post memos, just a nice, not three by five little room to do some copying. It's a great dream. All right, great. We will we'll frame that. We'll keep that for sure. That's helpful for them. All right, kindergarten, are y'all ready? Now then. Uh, that's okay. I decided to use pencil this time since I um, gave myself a sleeve tattoo, is that what it's called? Um, so you probably can't see it. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on the toilet down there and you guys can't even see it. So <laughs> this is our classroom. Um, I did it. Yeah. But, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is our door over here. We have a carpeted area <laughs> and um, a tiled area like we had mentioned previously. Um, we wanted to do flexible seating, maybe some desks, tables, and one of the slides that um, we had shared, there was like a table that had like storage but it was movable too. And maybe we could put supplies there or kids could work in those spaces. Um, we mentioned a dramatic play area with like a kitchen from back in the day, just so the kids could get more opportunities to socialize and um, we could kind of increase their collaboration and play and a recess even. Windows, I mentioned like um, the windows that have like the blinds inside of them are kind of nice because um, the other blinds are not that great. They've probably been here for a hundred years, so it's understandable. Um, and then a whiteboard, maybe even a smart board up front. This carpeted area, um, we originally had more carpeted area, but then we realized um, we really only need that for like we're reading to them or we're doing like a morning meeting. Um, and then back here we have cabinets and countertops um, with the cabinets above the countertops and below. We put a sink in there. Right now our sinks in the kindergarten classrooms that have them are connected or beside the countertop, which is wooden. So it gets really wet and warps and stuff. So I don't know if we could have like a different location where it's not inside the countertop or something like that. If it's required, we mentioned, we drew the bathroom. Um, the trash can is bigger than the toilet because they can't seem to get the trash in the trash can. So, and there's a flower there for the scented floral scent. <laughs> And then over here where my fingers are, um, we have cubbies and then storage above the cubbies. And then we just kind of added some notes that you can't see, but if we had like a kindergarten pod, like if you come out of your classroom, um, we could have like a sensory space that maybe could be utilized for kids that need that or an indoor recess type area or just to get some movement going on. Um, 
a space for small groups, your ITI or intervention where it's a little quieter, um, some bulletin boards to display student work, um, a projector out there. The kids love to do movement activities with Go Noodle and Jack Hartman. Um, if you don't know who he is, Google that after this meeting um, and dance along. So they would love that if you had like an open space for them to do that. Um, and then just central bathrooms, maybe in the middle of the pod and maybe even a workroom for the classrooms that were down there. So our, um, I don't know, that was it. Anything else you guys wanna add? No, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, fifth grade, I think y'all focused on what a pod, dream pod might be. <laughs> okay, for fifth grade and fourth grade, we thought if we mirrored a hallway, that's basically the three, the two teams, three fifth grade classrooms that would open into each other, especially when we don't have a sub, we can just open the wall. And then the fourth grade hallway would be mirrored exactly sharing the same IS spaces. And then for the Space ELA, what was that? <laughs> extended learning area. Extended learning area. Um, putting in like a partial wall or a, a wall like right in the middle that would kind of separate from the exit um, that has a stage. That's my own personal thing. <laughs> Having restrooms at the end and a lounge and storage, but that could also easily be moved to share with fourth grade so that the four or five hallway where, you know, we switch classes and we have the lockers and all that would all be shared. Thank you. We got comments to add lots more restrooms. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, this group did kind of overall building, just comments, ideas, thoughts on kind of what has been discussed. Does anybody want to touch on a few of the high points? <laughs> <laughs> you just have to maybe just mention a few. You don't have to. I don't want to. You have to read. Make you talk the whole thing. Okay. So yeah, we kind of killed the custodial one the first time around. Uh, we did add having their own washer and dryer. There's only one washer and dryer, so it's hard to get the um, cleaning rags through the washer dryer cycles. Um, so this was the overall things: is outside windows in every classroom, storage in every classroom, separate playgrounds for K two versus three five. Like so you mentioned. Built in lockers or cubbies, common areas uh, or the core areas would be centralized. So things like the gym, cafeteria, art room, music room, tech lab, administrator offices, maybe teacher workrooms, but those might be in, the, in each layer. Um, more student workspace, a teacher lounge or lounges, more student and staff restrooms, a full size gym, storm shelter. And then planning for growth. So this is um, one thing that I asked about is that currently kindergarten rooms require a bathroom for OFC fuel. And our trend is that um, the elementary is growing the fastest of, you know, of all the grades or of all the buildings. So maybe we could, we could build more classrooms that would qualify as kindergarten because it would be harder in the future to add a bathroom or make it um, the bigger size because it's also a bigger size room. So just something to think about. I don't, I don't think we're probably going to do this, but she said there's no, no funding limits at the moment. <laughs> and again, with, with no funding limits, an auditorium with cushy seats. <laughs> um, and sound deadening in the hallways and rooms. And then also for custodial furniture on wheels, because they said it's much easier to move the furniture in the high school that's on wheels to do the cleaning and put it back. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right, great. And we've got this group here. Intervention, a pod, kind of through the lens of intervention too. All right, this is our pod topia. So we suggest making our own level hive. And these are all the honeycombs branching off or bee wings, whatever you want to call them. So it could be the big great fans, Grade levels, obviously everyone would need technology, such as smart boards, lots of outlets, we talked about that. Um, mics, voice amplifiers, 
Uh, we talked about a common area for each grade level, having like the study cubbies that they showed as an example, multiple areas for small groups, but they could be larger small groups, like up to 10 kids. Um, every gen ed classroom would have a very large storage closet, but each grade level could get like a storage room for common, like wooden wisdom books, that sort of thing. So in our design, we talked about having the entrance actually be at the back or the side of the building so that the front is more aesthetically pleasing and that way you can have cars wrapping around more for drop off and pick up. So we have like a covered entrance and then like a common area where the kids could, that would be like our holding tank, so to say, with the office right there, teacher workroom, we would have the double-sided cafetorium with the gym, teacher lounge would be on that side, and then every grade level would have their own hallway, and we would put that extended learning area at the front of each hallway where that could be your title teachers, your special ed teachers, your related services like OT and PT, speech, sensory spaces. Every hallway would have its own restroom, and then the space between each grade level would be for example, like an art room, a garden or outdoor learning space with some of that tiered seating, potentially technology, world languages, music. And that's our game. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. I like it. I like the concept, the behind. It's great. Um, we got one more group. Is that right? Okay, one last group, and you all focused on some of the processes in the media center. Okay, just uh, we concentrated on the checkout area, return area, just like we said right now, as you walk in and you get stuck there and there's nowhere to go. One, if we have a circulation desk for Holly to be at, since she doesn't have one of those, but we even wondered about setting up maybe two or three um, kid-friendly kiosks for returning and checking out books, thinking maybe more that's the upper grades, even second through fifth that um, K-1 might need more assistance. Obviously, they need training on it, but uh, Sarah even said, I guess the public library has those type of things now anyway, so they would know that. So, just trying to help all out here. Give them more space. That's it. Awesome. Great, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas, tons of input. I feel like you all are, have a lot of consistent messages and, and comments, so that's great. We're not kind of all are on the same page on a lot of these things. So our job is to take a lot of this back, kind of digest it. Um, in the background, we're also working on the program of the building, meaning exactly how many classrooms do we need? How, what's the size? What are our requirements for square footage and plumbing fixtures and all those really fun building design processes? Exactly where might it be on the site? What are we looking at in terms of parking lot adjacencies and, and all of that. So our design team, we're just a few of a very large design team that will be kind of taking all of this feedback in and kind of um, looking at how we can incorporate a lot of those ideas into the space and, and how that affects the building design. So thank you so much. Um, we'll be, you know, just carbon copying the sketches and you'll see it on the floor plan soon. So thank you so much. Um, our next thing that we are gonna do as groups, but I think just in the interest of time, we could do it as one large group. It's guiding principles. And what I mean by that is just kind of, I'm just gonna ask for people to kind of offer up ideas or, or kind of um, speak up on your own. But the question is, this project will be successful and impactful if. All right, so thinking through kind of when this building opens, you know, it, you will all be really proud of it if, if what? And can you complete that sentence and share with us to capture? Yes. Um, yeah. okay. um, this project will be successful if it facilitates collaboration for students and staff. Facilitates collaboration for students and staff. Thank you. Yes. So, for me, this project will be successful priority. Um, if we're going to have class with those, making sure they have the same. So one of them we have downtown. We want to 
space you can really have a uh, truly secure campus where the doors lock and stay locked and they don't have to be labeled around to make them actually latch. Great security. Great. So focus on security and having a, an environment everyone feels safe in. That's great. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, this building it will be successful if we see a reflection of our ideas and our thoughts and the community's ideas and thoughts in the final part. Awesome. So a lot of these ideas are reflected in the final product. When you walk the halls or when you walk into your classroom in the future, you can say, oh, I remember when we talked about that or, you know, that you, you see some of this and the community's input as well. So thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, if it meets what's necessary for children and not what's convenient for adults. Okay, it meets the needs of the kids and not necessarily just convenient for adults. That's a great one. Kind of thinking about your students as, as your customer, as your client, your product. Yeah. Uh, we've already mentioned a lot about the historical. It's not like round walls or white walls. It's Lot of color, like a cheerful color and happy and inspiring, yeah. welcoming. Yeah, I think the community will still want their traditional design. <laughs> so finding that right balance yeah. that meets kind of Bethel's your culture. How we can we make it fun, inviting, welcoming, and kind of meet the community's expectations? Okay, that's our design challenge. It's true, it's the needs of all kids, including gifted, special, ELL, yeah. like all kids. All kids. All age levels, all abilities, everyone. It is, we've thought about everybody in the design of this building, and that's when it will be successful. It's great. Anyone? Yes. Um, this project will be successful and impactful if we plan for potential continued growth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So keeping that future growth in mind, knowing that you're on a certain trend and it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. Great. Anyone else? Yes. Different perspective. Is it opens on time and on budget? On time and on budget. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it from him, but you didn't say it. <laughs> yes, on time and on budget. Anyone else? Awesome. Okay. Well, then I think um, we've got just a couple minutes, and the only thing we had left is to just kind of talk about our next steps. Um, we did a lot about this, but our next steps uh, is kind of identifying, taking some of this feedback we've heard from everybody today, and looking at some school building tours to go on. I think we're talking about taking a, a group, uh, a smaller group. Uh, maybe not the whole group, but having representatives on a few building tours to kind of really be able to see in real life um, some of these environments and how they do or don't work well for, um, for schools that have maybe built recently or have had major renovations. So we'll have a couple of those coming up. And then also we'll have another educational visioning, um, similar, uh, taking a lot of this feedback, input from the tours, input from some of the background work that I mentioned, some of those those code studies, the program development, and really trying to start to put this on paper. So, kind of start putting ideas together. Um, if you have additional feedback or any comments that you think of in the middle of the night, that comes up for me, or in the shower, whatever, <laughs> that you just didn't, uh, you know, get to say, or you don't think that was conveyed quite the way you wanted it, please don't hesitate to get those ideas to us. I just left this one because I wasn't sure, but. Would they, is there a, a maybe one point of contact? Is it, is it Justin or? Yeah, they can send it to me. Okay, so if you have an idea that is kind of, you think about it in the next couple days, please don't hesitate and send it our way. We would love to, to hear, continue to input. Um, and we will continue to um, hopefully keep you all updated on how the project's going. And mostly thank you for giving up your time and being willing to speak candidly about all your ideas today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.